are here to discuss the Miranda warnings, why a right to remain silent. So you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney and to have an attorney present during questioning. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided at state expense. We all know these Miranda warnings, but why do we have them? Where do they come from? That's what we're going to talk about here today. Let's begin all the way back on July 14, 1896, aboard the American merchant vessel, the Herbert Fuller. The ship is en route from Boston to Argentina, carrying a cargo of lumber. On board is a crew of 10, the captain's wife, and a single passenger, a Harvard University student named Lester Monks. It's a little after 2 a.m., and Monks is awakened by a scream, followed by a gurgling noise. He grabs his revolver and goes to investigate. In the nearby captain's cabin, he finds the cot overturned and the captain lying on the floor beside it. Receiving no response or answer to his query, he puts his hand on the captain's body and finds it to be damp or wet. Moving on to the room of the captain's wife, he doesn't see her, but he sees dark stains on her bedding. Realizing what has happened, he proceeds to the deck where he finds first mate Thomas Bram and tells him the captain has been killed. And indeed, three persons had been killed. The captain, the captain's wife, and the second mate, uh, apparently hacked to death with an ax. When the crew are aroused and assembled the next morning, none are found with blood spatters. So crew member Westerberg is appointed second in command, and they set course for Halifax, Nova Scotia. It wasn't the closest port, but the winds were most favorable. Only the next day, the story spreads that Westerberg, who was actually on watch shortly before the murders were discovered, had changed his clothes after his watch. Confronted, Westerberg does not deny the charge, but says it was done to avoid a chill. Unconvinced, Bram has him shackled. Four days later, Westerberg came forward with some new information. When he was at the wheel on his watch through a skylight window, he saw Bram kill the captain. Bram denies the charge, but he too is placed in chains and the boat continues on to Halifax. And after arriving, a Canadian officer conducts the following interrogation. When Mr. Bram came into my office, I said to him, Bram, we're trying to unravel this horrible mystery. Your position is rather an awkward one. I've had Westerberg in this office and he made a statement that he saw you do the murder. Bram said he could not have seen me. Where was he? I said he states he was at the wheel. Well, Bram said he could not see me from there. Did Bram just confess to the murder? Did he just say Westerberg could not have seen him commit the killing from that location? Possibly, but in context, almost surely not. The interrogation continued. I said, now look here, Bram, I'm satisfied that you killed the captain from all I've heard from Mr. Westerberg. But some of us here think you could not have done all that crime alone. If you had an accomplice, you should say so and not have the blame of this horrible crime on your own shoulders. Bram said, well, I think, and many others on board the ship think that Westerberg is the murderer, but I don't know anything about it. So Bram was almost surely saying that either from Westerberg's location, there's no way he could have seen into the captain's quarters, or that from that location, he could not see Bram about his duty uh, on deck. But his words were introduced at his murder prosecution as a, quote, inferential confession. There was absolutely no physical evidence, zero. It's the wonderful world of a murder on the high seas in the 19th century. But based on the testimony of that officer and of Westerberg, Bram was convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. The United States Supreme Court, however, reversed and ordered a new trial. Why? On the grounds that Bram's words were involuntary. Now, the law of voluntariness is a topic for another lecture, but in a nutshell, if interrogators overbear a suspect's will such that the statements were not voluntary, those statements are not admissible at trial. An easy case would have been if the officer had put a gun to Bram's head in order to obtain the confession. The Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Okay. But I assure you that statements obtained under far greater pressures and inducements than Bram faced are introduced in American courtrooms every day. So what made the Supreme Court so gun-shy in this case? Well, let me read just a short passage from the court's opinion. 
It cannot be doubted, said the court, that placed in the position in which the accused was when the statement was made to him that the other suspected person had charged him with crime. The result was to produce upon his mind the fear that if he remained silent, it would be considered an admission of guilt and therefore renders certain his being committed for trial as the guilty person. And it cannot be conceived that the converse impression would not also have naturally arisen, that by denying there was hope of removing the suspicion from himself. So the court was concerned that Bram didn't realize he could safely remain silent. And this concern expressed by the court in 1896 would come to ultimate fruition some 70 years later in the famous Miranda versus Arizona. But before turning to Miranda, two uh, loose ends. One, I should finish my story, right? What happened or became of Bram? So we said his conviction was reversed. Well, he was retried, this time without the testimony uh, of the officer, and he was convicted once again. But there had actually been a change in the law, so at least he was, this time, spared the death penalty. He served 15 years in prison. He was released on parole in 1913. And in 1919, President Woodrow Wilson granted him a full pardon, seemingly accepting his claim of innocence. Two, second loose end, why this Supreme Court interest in a right to remain silent? Indeed, why a general American fascination with a right to remain silent? In any civilized country, a defendant can remain silent. After all, what are we going to do? Beat it out of you? No, we're not. So you can remain silent. But in most, a fact finder is free to make inferences from that silence. And in our general lives, we would make inferences from silence. Why don't I believe Westerberg? Because he didn't claim to have seen Bram commit the murder until one, he was placed in custody himself for the crime, and two, until four more days had passed. Now, it's entirely possible that there are other reasons for him maintaining that silence, perhaps including fear of Bram. But I think it's most likely that he made up the whole thing to defer suspicion from himself. His silence when he was initially confronted makes me doubt his newly told story. If I were to ask my child, did you eat the last cookie? Silence. <laughs> Are you telling me I'm not supposed to infer anything from that silence? Now, it's entirely possible, isn't it, that there are other reasons. Maybe my child just suffered a severe stroke and cannot speak, <laughs> right? Or maybe she's entirely innocent, but she realizes, well, if I profess my innocence, that will point the finger at a sibling, and her mind is racing to figure out how she can deflect both. But it's much more likely, isn't it, that knowledge of her guilt, perhaps remembering how tasty that cookie was, is causing her to be silent. So where do we get the notion that the Fifth Amendment right, which we just read, which says nothing about not inferring from silence, is meant to not only permit silence, but is to prohibit any inference therefrom? Well, it derives at least in part from the allegedly cruel trilemma of the English Star Chamber. The Star Chamber was an ecclesiastical court in England, and when you were hailed before it, you were placed under oath requiring you to answer the questions that would be asked. So imagine you were guilty and you're called before the star chamber. What were your options as you were then questioned? You could speak truthfully, in which case you criminally condemn yourself. You could lie, in which case you would, via false oath, damn yourself eternally, under the belief system of the time, certainly, and potentially, therefore, face both excommunication from the church and be prosecuted for perjury. Or you could remain silent, in which case you're prosecuted for contempt of court. So this was the allegedly cruel trilemma of self-accusation, perjury, or contempt. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Think back to Bram. Now, assuming he was guilty, assuming he had killed those three people above, aboard that ship, what were his options when he was questioned in Halifax? Well, he could tell the truth, in which case he would criminally condemn himself. He could lie, but at least today it's a crime to give a false statement to a police officer, so he could be prosecuted for that. Or he could remain silent, but Bram didn't realize that. That troubled the court, and they reversed his conviction. Okay, so on to Miranda. On March 3rd, 1963, an 18-year-old girl leaves her work at a movie theater concession stand in Phoenix, Arizona, and takes a bus home. Walking from the bus stop to her home, she's kidnapped, forcibly placed in the back of a vehicle, and raped. Upon her release, she runs home, tells her family, who contact police. 
Ten days later, they arrest Ernesto Miranda and conduct a lineup at the police station. She makes a positive identification, so he is then questioned by two police officers. Two hours later, the officers emerge with a written confession. There are no allegations of threats, intimidation, or promises, and they in fact warned him before obtaining that confession that any statements he made would be used against him. Then what's the problem? Well, to the Supreme Court that he wasn't affirmatively made aware that he had a right to remain silent and, if he wished, that he right, had a right to have counsel present during that interrogation. The court held that unless a suspect is affirmatively made aware of these rights, and unless the suspect knowingly and voluntarily waives those rights, any confession resulting from custodial interrogation will not be admissible at trial. Miranda v. Arizona may well be the most well-known criminal procedure decision in American history. Certainly, we at least all know the rights that we began the lecture with today. But it was not popular at the time. It was a five to four decision. So a vote of a single justice would have changed the outcome of the case. The dissents were strident. They warned of the many criminals that would now not successfully be prosecuted. In the upcoming presidential election of 1968, there were three major candidates, a Republican and Democrat, and including an independent. None of them would defend Miranda. So it's had a bit of a hard life, even in the Supreme Court, after it was announced in 1966. So there are exceptions to Miranda, there are complications to Miranda, but the core right remains. So let's spend a few minutes with what concerned the court about custodial interrogation in the Miranda decision. Fortunately, the police techniques that concerned the court in 1966 were not physical beatings. We certainly had those cases into the 1930s, where an officer would take the stand and admit beating the suspect in order to obtain a confession. But both at common law and under the Constitution, that would render a confession involuntary, and so it would be inadmissible. Instead, the court was concerned with the more modern psychological coercion. First, the interrogation takes place in a police-dominated atmosphere in which the suspect is alone with the interrogator. Is that troubling? Well, in a sense, of course not. Right? It would be absurd if police could only question a suspect in his or her own living room, sitting in an easy chair, supported by mom and the lover. Right? That, that would be an absurd world. But remember that without Miranda, there was no way to stop an interrogation. And remember that innocent people get arrested with some frequency. It's simply unavoidable. So imagine your son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter are arrested, placed in a small concrete interrogation room, and questioned. And the interrogation goes on and on, hour after hour. It's terrifying. Right? It's intimidating. Two, the police engage in maximization, meaning they maximize their alleged confidence in your guilt. In the words of the Miranda court, the guilt of the subject is to be posited as a fact. The interrogator should direct his comments toward the reasons why the subject committed the act rather than court failure by asking the subject whether he did it, close quote. Again, this makes sense. It would be absurd, wouldn't it, if police had to say, you know what, we really have no idea who did this, <laughs> right? We've got nothing. Did you? That would not work very effectively. So we understand where this comes from, but it can also, again, be troubling. Uh, imagine in the uh, Miranda case, just to make up a conversation, right? The maximization. Damn it, Ernesto, stop your lies. We know you did it. We're not here to talk about that. We're not wasting any more time about that. We just want to know why. Maximization. Three, police engage in minimization, meaning they minimize the moral seriousness and legal seriousness of the offense. They cast blame upon the victim and offer legal excuses for the suspect's alleged actions. If it were a killing, it was probably in self-defense, right? Everybody knew he was a no-good bum. Everybody knew he was violent. He'd killed people before. You were worried he was going to take you next. Isn't that? That's what it was, wasn't it? You didn't want to kill him. You just wanted to protect yourself. Of course, once they get the suspect to latch on to such an explanation, they move on to present the facts that make such a legal excuse impossible. Four, police create, quote, from the Miranda opinion, an oppressive atmosphere of dogged persistence. They must interrogate steadily and without relent, leaving the subject no prospect of surcease, close quote. So the suspect understands very well there is only one way to end this, and that is to confess. In the words of one men innocent, 
mentally retarded suspect from whom the police obtained a confession. He was, um, you know, if you just, you know, tell us that you did it, you know, we'd all go home. So, you know, at that point, I thought they meant me too. That's exactly what police want suspects to think, and sometimes they go to great lengths to create that false impression. Fifth, police lie. They lie about finding your fingerprints at the scene. They lie about finding your semen in the rape victim. They lie about finding blood in your room. They lie about having witnesses who will testify to seeing you commit the crime. In fact, sometimes they go so far as lying about witnesses who will testify to seeing you commit other crimes, hoping that the terror of facing these other charges will lead you to fess up to this one. Now, sometimes their lies are humorous. They tape a suspect to a Xerox machine and tell them that it's a lie detector test and photocopy a sheet of paper that says lie. All right? uh, and sometimes they have subjected suspects to a humidity test, which allegedly shows how recently the person has showered, which explains why there's no blood on the person's body. Uh, they could threaten to um, develop the murder victim's eyeballs. So they'll say, look, everybody knows that when you die, the last thing you see is permanently etched on your eyeballs. So all we have to do is go down to the morgue and develop those eyeballs. You might as well confess now. Well, when will eyes, humorous or not, ensnare a cold-blooded killer or child rapist? Many don't have much sympathy. Some do, believing either that morality demands more of police or that ultimately lies corrupt and make it more likely that police will break other rules. But some have no sympathy. The Miranda court gave both the guilty and the innocent suspect a way to avoid this interrogation. So do they take advantage? Well, some do, but estimates are that 80% of suspects waive their Miranda warnings. So police are actually now in favor, predominantly, of Miranda warnings. Because once you Mirandize, it is very rare to find the court and under the circumstances that will exclude a confession. So in a nutshell, that's the story of Miranda. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.